Well, Merry Christmas from everyone at EV News Daily. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? Only thing is, it's it's just me making this podcast. Well, and my long-suffering wife as well, who has to listen to me talking about EVs all the time. So anyway, uh, Merry Christmas from me and Mrs Lee. What a year it's been for electric cars. You can feel a change in the air. There are more cars on sale than ever before, more of them on the streets, and more people evangelising about driving them. And thank you, too. Well, this podcast began on the 17th of January 2018, and apart from a week on vacation, I've not skipped making a daily show. In fact, when we added Patreon in August, I now make two shows on a Saturday, one of them a bonus show for those who support at the super posh coffee level, otherwise known as $10. For those supporters, and look, when I say I took a vacation, we actually went for a week in Norway, which is the EV capital of the world, to see what's going on. And it really is a glimpse into an exciting future where you can walk down the street and a stream of cars comes past you and not a single one is belching out toxic fumes. If this is the future, I like it. Now, you won't be surprised to hear, it's a little bit quiet today on Christmas Day, and so we have a special interview for you. Now, I first met Phil earlier this year when he was at a trade show for battery storage, and I was harassing him on his phone to provide updates for you to listen to on the show. Well, since then, Phil, who is the MD of Electric Future, he now kindly supports this show, not only financially, but keeps me abreast of what I need to know. And like Santa coming down the chimney to leave you presents, if your idea of a good old gift is a a chat about EVs, well, Phil Roberts is here to talk cars, storage, solar, and lots more as well. Merry Christmas, and welcome to the show, Phil Roberts. Thanks very much, Martin. Nice to speak to you. So we've spoken to you before when you have uh, updated our listeners on storage. I chat to you on Twitter all the time to pick your brains, and you are the EV News Daily podcast Patreon premium partner. And so you uh, you tick all of those three boxes. And thank you very much, firstly, for, for all of those and all of your support this year. So for anybody that hasn't heard me talking about uh, about what you do, very briefly, let's just let's explain what you do with your business, which is Electric Future, which is both established and sort of a startup. Can you can you explain? Because I always do a bad job of explaining it. <laughs> Yeah, we used to be a, a part of a larger construction company called GMI. So we were known previously as GMI Energy. Last year, they decided that they didn't really want us play in the energy space anymore. And so offered us the opportunity to buy the company out. Um, so we bought the, the renewable element of um, what was GMI Energy and became Electric Future. So we specialize in large scale solar, commercial solar, battery storage and um, EV charging. So obviously that's the interest in uh, EV. And personally, of course, you drive one yourself as well. I do, yes. I drive a, a Nissan Leaf, 40 kilowatt hour. So I've had that for a year. Uh, it was one of the very first ones to come into the country. So I was probably one of the uh, the earlier ones to discover the problems that it also had as well. Okay, so let's let's uh, on the podcast today. We want to look back at where EVs have been over the last uh, twelve months, and we want to look forward as well. We want to talk to you because you give us greater insight than anyone else. And I pick your brains on energy storage and all those kind of things and some PV. So let's start with EVs, which is, I guess, why most people are tuning into the podcast. You were one of the first in the world, really, to get that forty kilowatt hour leaf. So what do you? So your impressions after twelve months of ownership? You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then. Um, it's a great car. Um, really love the car. Love the, the driving experience, the driving dynamic of it. Nobody beats you away from the lights. It's very, very quick and nimble at low speed. Range for me is a little bit limited. I have a, a 20,000 uh, miles per year sort of average. Generally, my day-to-day, 90% of the time, is fine. It's sort of 160-mile range. Um, you do get a little, little bit of variation between winter and summer miles. So sort of anything below five degrees, it does come down, probably down to about 120-mile range, which for most of the time is fine. But when you do uh, long-range trips, so say we do Leeds to London as a quite a regular one, um, then obviously you have to go to a rapid charger. When you rapid charge, if you do it multiple times in one day because the battery doesn't have thermal management, then it overheats. And so it throttles itself back to protect the battery which is a problem if you want to go long distances and repeat you know repeat multi uh, rapid charges and that that has caused me a problem over this last year which has sort of led me to look at replacing it hopefully with a, a 60 kilowatt leaf but having found out that that's not going to have thermal management on the battery that sort of made me think mm, maybe that's not the car so at the moment i've ordered a um, an e-nero for uh, delivery as soon as they they're available you've actually ordered one 
deposit of uh, of interest apparently that's what uh, it's yeah it. there we go because <laughs> no one quite knows yet so this happened with the Hyundai Kona and dealers were taking they were saying well we'll take your deposit uh, of interest and we'll put your name on the list but we don't know how we're going to sell it yet and then when it finally came around to selling the Hyundai Kona click to buy which is the online thing took i think even some i don't know some dealers took them by surprise. Others knew it was coming. And so that's, I think that's a fair thing to say. So it would be interesting to know if a similar thing will happen with Kia or whether they're going to go purely down the dealer route. But that's... Uh, I mean, either way, by the way, with the with the Konas, as, as, as you may know, even the people that had done it through the dealer were then sort of first in queue. But there was there are two people in the UK who do click to buy for Hyundai. And so they were furiously typing details in for, that have been supplied by the dealers as well as people who were buying them online. So, and then, so you think... Uh, so you think it's time to swap out of the leaf after just a year purely on the need for you to do those long distances yeah um i think the the ability to do 260 miles um from one charge you know is going to make a big difference for me personally um i mean i don't i don't charge every day you know i have the ability to charge at home um and to be honest uh, i've made give myself a little bit of an experiment and used only a three pin plug so I decided not to install a seven kilowatt charger and see how that would affect me at home. And I've survived fine for a year without a, a seven kilowatt charger. So just with a, a, a two kilowatt granny charger, as it's known in the UK, and it's worked. It's worked OK. There have been times where I could have probably done with that bigger seven kilowatt charger at home. Uh, but I think definitely the move to a 64 kilowatt hour battery is going to require a seven kilowatt home charger. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of juice to get in on a three pin plug. And my stepbrother, who is an electrician, he's O level approved for putting in these things. He's never keen on me using the granny charger, the three pin plug, which here in the UK we're on to 40 volts anyway. So it's not like in the US if you're at 120, where it would be ridiculously slow to charge. But if you, if you are a and although we're not three phase here, but if you're at uh, 230, 240 volts, it's a reasonable way to get energy into an EV. He's never massively keen on me doing that. He would rather, he, he would much prefer that he come and put something on the side of, of my house and, and we'll get onto that maybe later on the podcast or, or a different show in terms of charging. So uh, with the Leaf, would you recommend that to people listening now under certain use cases then? People who just kind of do town driving? Because you sound like you like the car. Yeah, it's a great car. You know, the, the it handles well. Um, you know, it's quick off the mark. It's it's quite an exciting. I mean, I've had a, a, a long history of relative performance cars: Subaru Impreza's, Focus RS, you know, BMW 330, and it's equally as exciting to drive, especially at, at sort of lower speeds as any of those cars. It's just when you come to doing those long trips. Um, that does cause me an issue. Now that I, I'm aware that you know that's I'm not the typical driver. You know I want to do you know long distance trips probably two three times a month. Um, you know where I'm doing sort of 400 miles in a day with a, a 260 mile range that would make a significant difference to to what my driving style. You know and that would give me that ability to to go to drive to London, find a car park with a seven kilowatt charger in it, charge you know during the day whilst I'm at a meeting, come back drive home. You know, with with no problem, it's, it's virtually no different than any other car at that point. In fact, probably better because you don't, don't have to go to the fuel station on the way. Um, I've had discussions this week online with people about um, could you survive without a home charger? And I think probably with a 260 mile range, I think you probably could because you could go to a supermarket and charge in a 50 kilowatt rapid, and that would give you enough for for most people for a, for a week's worth of driving. And of course, with the Hyundai Kona, the Kia Soul, your Kia e Nero can charge up to uh, 70, the low 70 kilowatts, like 71 kilowatts is their uh, maximum charge speed. So uh, there's nowhere in the UK really you can do that. There's an Alpha Power one, which is 100 kilowatts, I think maybe more, but there's the new Ionity network opening up Gretna Greens. The first one, their charges will be 350 kilowatts. So even if you don't have a home charger, but you don't want to spend all day charging and you are parking your car on the street, for instance, with that with that range, you can afford to just go to the rapid charger once a week and not spend more than you know, 20 minutes there. Let me ask a question. If, if the Tesla Model 3 was available outside of the US, would it be on your shopping list? I have one on order. <laughs> I was, I, I was a first day order. First cars are going to be the performance version and the long-range um, dual motor, um, which... I have a feeling in the UK could end up being 
towards high 50s. Um, it's a lot of money the, for a car. The, the, yeah. It's a lot of money, and I don't know whether or not that really suits what you know. Whether I really want to spend that amount of money, especially if you could maybe get a Taycan, which was maybe just a little bit more, because I think the Taycan is probably going to hold its money significantly. You know, it's, they're, they're sold out for. Well, the rumours are that they're sold out for twelve to eighteen months on pre-orders, and and I think if you if you're going down the route of that model, you could well end up with a, a car that really does preserve its value. Yeah, so much so that even the other cars that are built on that platform that will be technically coming later, like the Audi e-tron GT, like I, I gather there's a Bentley that's being looked at on the Taycan platform, such as the popularity of the Porsche, even though those cars will technically be launched later, there's not such demand and you could get your car you know, sooner. Um, it looks like an amazing car. So let's talk a little bit about the other things that you do. You do big commercial scale solar and PV and storage as well. How has 2018, it's been a, a fascinating year for everything from the supply of panels to the pricing of panels. Uh, t- tell us about this year for your business. Yeah, we've um, because we're obviously based in UK and part of the EU at the moment, um, Panel, our panel prices have been um, sort of governed by EU legislation, which put minimum import prices on for panels that came from China. Um, and so consequently, up until sort of mid part of the year, prices have remained fairly stable. But we had the minimum import pricing got removed from, I think it was August time. Um, and that's had quite a drastic effect on the, uh, the panel pricing. Um, most of the major manufacturers, main factories are all based in China. Um, towards the end of this year, Chinese subsidies um, changed for their own domestic projects. And so off the back of that, there was uh, quite a lot of free supply in the market, um, which timed perfectly for the minimum import pricing being removed on European panels. And so we've seen quite a decline in uh, panel price costs this last quarter, uh, which has meant that if you look at the rate of return that a PV project delivers to a, a commercial customer, it's gone up by around about 30% um, during this last quarter. So the, the rates of return have really improved to just about as good as we've seen it, even at the height of the feeding tariffs. Um, and so it looks really positive for next year. So if you're listening around the world, we had a thing here in the UK, which was the feed-in tariff. I talk about on the podcast, the FITS sometimes. And uh, many years ago, the government, in order to encourage PV on domestic roofs and uh, commercial as well, they were offering any generation. There was two elements of it, but the, 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 the first and probably the most attractive to people was that any excess generation from your house, if you were out all day at work in the office, but your house was generating electricity and then you know you weren't at home to put the dishwasher or on the washing machine and the heating, then any excess could be sold back to the grid. The prices were initially, I mean, very good. You could make you could make money depending on your situation on this. And then it's tapered down. The whole thing goes in March, and then after that, any excess generation that your house or your you know your project generates will then go to the grid for free, which is certainly something that people have an opinion about. But then again, I remember when I first. You know, being a bit of a geek uh, uh, over the years, you know, I've always thought, oh, man, I'd love some solar on my house. And and going back to the first house that we bought, you know, the quote was £20,000. And so that was for a small terraced house. Absolutely no way can I afford that. So in in your perspective, this year has been a big turning point for the affordability. Again, because, you know, you're not you're not selling six or eight panels at a time. I'm guessing I'm guessing you buy slightly more. Yeah, yeah, generally containers. So yeah, we, we're buying typically sort of 170 kilowatts at a time uh, in a container. Um, and yeah, prices have gone down significantly. I mean, when I first started um, installing back in sort of 2010, 2011, we were paying £4,200 per kilowatt that we installed. Um, on a large scale commercial, that could now be down to say £600 per kilowatt installed. Um, so it's it's come down very significantly, and just in this last year, it's come down around about another twenty five percent. So it's you know we're seeing we're seeing projects in the UK with uh, most people base them off how long how quickly does it pay back, and um, we're seeing paybacks now in the region of around about four to five years in some areas. That's incredible. And for anyone who is thinking, if they're listening around the world to the podcast, isn't the UK pretty cloudy? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not the best weather, but you can. But PV is still an option, even in a country like this, yeah? The big thing to bear in mind is what's the value of power where you are? Because we do commercial work, we used to work for a number of um, UK companies that had sites across the world. And so I've quite often looked at the, the value of electric in different places around the world. Um, and I know America has a, a, a large variation from some states in Midwest where it's, it's two, three cents per kilowatt hour, you know, through to other states where it's, you know, 20. Uh, and so, and varying uh, requirements in terms of legislation for renewables, uh, amount of production that's on the network in those different states. Um, and in the UK, at the moment, we're having quite large energy price rises. So we've seen commercial clients go from uh, nine pence last year to 13 pence this year. Um, that doesn't really seem to filter through to the, the domestic market yet. But I think people are um, going to be expecting quite large rises over this next year. And that obviously affects the payback of the solar. That means that the solar pays back quicker. So the conjunction of prices dropping in terms of the cost of the install and also energy costs rising is meaning that solar is becoming a larger and larger um, player. So we talk about here in the UK, there's no longer an incentive to sell back to the grid, but many places around the world have been living with that for uh, for a long time anyway. Of course, the answer, if you have overproduction, is then to store your own energy, which is another thing that your business does. So looking back at 2018, what's the storage market been like this year? Been a bit of a turmoil in the UK. Um most of the, the large-scale commercial projects were based on something called frequency response. So if you were trying to do a, a battery project, the, the highest value service that you could do with a battery was to do with frequency response. Uh, frequency response is basically a reaction to the amount of load that's on the network at any one time. So you know, if you imagine everybody puts the kettle on, there's more load on the network. The generating stations struggle to keep up or it becomes harder to turn the, the status within the generators. Um, and so they need to either turn up the amount of generation on the network to try and ease that, um, or conversely, if you have less demand on the network, turn those down to respond to the changes and the demand. Now, one thing that batteries are really good at is instantly delivering power, as in an EV, um, or regenerating uh, from that uh, available power to respond to frequency changes. So they're very good at you know instantly inputting power into a network or drawing power off the network to charge themselves to help balance the network supply and demand. I saw a tweet last night from Ovo Energy talking about the very first uh, domestic customer that they have put in a vehicle to grid charger, Ovo being an, an energy provider here in the UK. And of course, if you have a, a Chadamo car, so in other words, if you have a Nissan Leaf, then it becomes an option because that's bi-directional. The, uh, the idea of using your car in to, for your own supply, is that something that you've heard of in terms of your circles of work much this year, or is that still kind of very much pie-in-the-sky stuff? No, it's, it's early stage, but there are certainly a number of people that are looking at that market. UK energy market is probably one of the more advanced markets in the world in terms of um, just being open from a cost com competition point of view. Um, we have a um, quite a, a unique model in the, the, the way that things, or the, the way that the power is transmitted across the network and then the way that the, uh, the players who sell power to an end user participate in the network means that we can use services and, and other forms of revenue generation to manipulate the price of energy to to an end customer um, and bi-directional charging is one of those things you know that they if you look at the the cost of energy through a day um, it varies on what we call the half hour market so energy is sold back into the market every half an hour through the day and the cost varies from some points in the middle of the day if you've got lots of wind where power is virtually free um, because we've got oversupply on the market through to other points, say uh, tea time where we've got businesses still operating. We've got people coming home from work and, you know, putting ovens on um, and domestic load at home. Um, power then gets very expensive. So things like bi-directional charging from a car just to be able to serve small amounts of load to assist power stations coming on and off to match the, the load or demand generation 
is a really good way of influencing the price structure for a, a domestic user. Let's turn around and, and look forward and look forward to 2019. We know the cars that are coming are going to be the next generation, really, of... The, the, well, 20, 2019 is going to be a year, firstly, of the cheaper Korean cars, the Hyundais and Kias, which are fantastic. We won't get the... In the Western markets, we won't get the Chinese cars yet. We know they're coming, the quality's getting better, and we know at some point they'll start making uh, versions for America and Europe. We know it's coming. It's just a matter of when. But next year really will be the year that VW uh, gets into it with their ID range, their MEB platform, which is all the, the VW brands are going to be spinning off. So we know that EV is going to be, uh, if 2018 was a huge year, tw- 2019 even bigger. Uh, for you at Electric Future, in terms of looking forward to how everything comes together with not just EV, but also with more PV and more storage. How's 2019 looking? Because uh, with battery production, there's more of that happening in the world, but again, there's more EVs being made. So can we can we even get hold of batteries for domestic use, or is there still a shortage of those? Yeah, it's definitely a tight market at the moment, and I think it's going to remain tight for certainly the next probably three to four years. Uh, we're actually a, a Tesla partner, so we install Tesla power walls. Um, it's no, um, I'm not really uh, giving anything away by saying that it's been difficult to get older power walls this last year. Yeah, I think I think it's fair yeah. to say that the Tesla themselves say that every spare cell they've got is going into the Model Three, and then there's some big industrial stuff they're doing with power packs. Uh, but I don't know whether they're using the you know, for those the 18650 cells or the 2170s. But but like either way, uh, that Tesla have certainly said themselves. I think for the first time. I've heard so openly this year, they've said, yes, Panasonic are our you know, pre- premier partner of everything, but we need to look beyond now that now. We need to find other sources of cells because we've got so much on. So, yeah, I think it's no secret there's, that there's, that, you know, that we're not exactly flush with, uh, with power walls for, for, for homes. But so you can still go onto the Tesla website, though, can't you? And you can still, you, know, you can still put your, your deposit down for a power wall, it, it, but it's going to be a long time till you get one. Yeah, I think that's going to ease this next um, quarter. I think, hopefully, um, from I think it's, you know there's, there's been plenty of publicity on the fact that um, they're actually extending the the battery cell production at the moment. So there are machines that are being installed um, to increase production capacity. It is the twenty one seventy that they use in Powerwall, uh, which is the same that's been used in Model Three, which is why we've had the the shortage of um, units. Um, my personal take on that is that obviously if they're putting in new machines, they're hoping to try and get towards the standard model, hopefully. Um, but I don't know anything from there. I've got no secret information on that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm hoping that that will ease things. And certainly if you look across the, the general market, um, LG Chem have announced that they're increasing the size of their Poland factory by, I think it's nearly 10 times. Um, CATL have been through a fundraising uh, this last year and they're increasing the size of their factory by four times. You know, there are 70 or so different cell factories across the world that are currently being built. Um, so, which we're going to see, you know, the supply situation eased. But there's part of me that also thinks that by the time those factories are built out, we're also going to be seeing a, a plethora of new models across the market, which are going to be demanding more battery as well. So it could be that it remains t- a tight situation in terms of battery supply, I think, for at least three to four years. One of the interesting things, we'll just finish off, the interesting things for commercial operators in 2019, it's going to be a case of why should I come to your business compared to, uh, as in you know, their business, why should I come to shop at, you know, shop A rather than shop B? And what I've been hearing a lot about in 2018 is people looking to 2019 and going, actually, we think one of the things that can be different, because everyone is fighting Amazon on price and all these things. Actually, one of the things that we can do to make the experience better, whether that is a shopping centre, whether that is a retail outlet, whether that is a a leisure centre where there's these things like bowling alleys and cinemas and stuff that are out of town. People are saying, actually, we think one of the things we can do in 2019 is more EV charges as a way of attracting people to, you know, to us as as a destination. Uh, Should they also be thinking about adding on some PV and some solar with those projects as well, so that they can say to people, not only are you charging your car for free, but also you're charging on green energy as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's something that we see from most of our commercial clients. Um, 
we certainly feel as though we've got to a, a tipping point in terms of you know the cost makes sense for for solar these days. You know, it's one of the cheapest forms of generation. Um, certainly, where you've got load during the day, um, and most people, I think, are, are you know are wanting to do the right thing for the planet, and you know wanting to do the right thing for for also for the pocket. You know, and I think it makes sense for for most people to look at going down that route. All right. So for people who have uh, uh, now want to know about more about what you do, uh, what's uh, what's the best way to um, find out more about your website? Is that the best place to go to? Yeah, definitely the website. So ef.energy, um, you know, .com or anything at the end of it, just ef.energy. Um, or follow me on Twitter, Phil Roberts, um, tweeting occasionally interesting things. Always interesting things. <laughs> and so 2019 shaping up to be a, a big year uh, for your company as well with like all the things that you've talked about with the re- reduction in the price that you're able to get and you can pass that on to your uh, your clients and your uh, your your customers. So looking like it's going to be a busy year next year? It, it is, yeah. yeah. We've already secured uh, our turnover for the last year for next year. Um, we're only uh, sort of two months into our financial year, so... Um, yeah, it looks really good. You know, the the economics for for solar certainly within the UK are very strong. Um, battery storage is getting there. You know, I think there's there's going to be some big changes in the market over this next year with uh, new models for energy supply. Um, I think it's going to be a difficult time for the traditional energy suppliers. You know, things are certainly changing. You know, I think that's that's evidenced by people like NG who are. Um, seeming to ditch the traditional models and they're sort of moving aggressively towards battery and uh, renewable generation. Hey, Phil, we got to the end of the podcast and didn't mention Brexit once. We did well. (laughs) We did well. We did okay. Brilliant. Well, thank you so thank you so much for everything that you've done this year uh, to bring the podcast to people all around the world. We've had a, a big growth story in a much smaller in a much smaller way than uh, than yourselves, but it's been a it's been a big growth year for the podcast, and uh, and now thousands of people every day are finding out more about this bright future that we have ahead of us. And so, thank you very much for everything you do to support the show to bring this to people for free. It's been great to listen. Uh, It's been uh, great to see it uh, grow over the year. Thank you very much for everything. And uh, I'll continue to to tap up your knowledge for the things that I can then talk about and then the things that you say. Like, you can't mention this publicly, but like this is what might be happening. So (laughs) I look forward to to more of that. Have uh, Have a wonderful new year and enjoy your celebrations. And no doubt we'll catch up in 2019. Indeed. And yourself and all the listeners as well. Yeah, thank you, Phil, so much for taking the time to record a Christmas Day special. Join me tomorrow as we look back at the highlights of 2018. We're just a few subscribers away from the big 150 on Patreon. Patreon.com slash evnewsdaily. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash evnewsdaily. If you, too, would like to have a look at that and think about supporting the show in order to spread the word wider around the world in 2019 and convert more people to EVs. Well, Merry Christmas, season's greetings, and if you're not celebrating the day itself, then just happy holidays or even happy Tuesday, whatever you're doing. Have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.